Thank you very much, uh, Bobby Scott, for uh, that uh, interesting exchange. I turn now to the distinguished gentleman from Iowa, Steve King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do thank the witnesses. It's an outstanding lineup of witnesses here, and I would uh, direct my first question to Mr. Lowell. Uh, caught my attention um, in speaking about intent. And um, in this discussion that we've had, this dialogue about intent, I would be curious as to if you had separate intents um, and maybe three almost simultaneous identical acts by different entities with different intents, are they still guilty of the same crime? To put flesh on the bones, Congressman King, in my brief introductory remarks today, I said the statute, I was speaking about Section 793 specifically, could apply again first to the government employee who had the confidentiality agreement and then said something or did something that she or he should not have. Mm -hmm. And then you have the person he's doing it to. It could be a foreign policy wonk. It could be somebody else. And then you could have the reporter who, as I said, overheard the conversation and published an article. And they're all responsible for releasing the exact same information. They may be releasing it in different ways. Ironically, the last hearer is going to disclose it to the most amount of people. The first person in the confidentiality agreement is disclosing it to the least number of people. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's easier to prosecute the first, as Professor Stone and others said it should be, than the last. So with intent, let's take that intent against the last three. As to the government employee, he or she knows that based on the confidentiality agreement and whatever he or she does, that it is not supposed to occur and there's very few excuses to go outside of channels to do it. If you protect whistleblowers, then putting that aside, the intent requirement is easier to prove. To the person who's not in the confidentiality agreement and is actively engaged in the exchange, as were the defendants in the so-called APAC case, that was very problematic because on Monday, White House officials or State Department officials brought them in to discuss foreign policy that they wanted them to know. And then three days later, somebody at a different level called them on the phone and talked about the same policy that was the subject of their indictment. Their intent, therefore, could have been proved by showing that what was legal on Monday should not be illegal on Wednesday. And then finally, when you get to the point of the media, that's where all the comments of the intent requirement, depending on their complicity in the original leak, will make a big difference. So you can take the same act and have three different standards of intent and still survive, I think, under a constitutional scheme. Mr. Weinstein, your comments on that? Congressman King, I actually agree with the idea of having sort of this tripartite approach. Um, Steve Vladek and, and Abby have, have described, I think, um, narrowing the, the provision for each of these different categories is going to make a more targeted piece of legislation. Then, then let me take this to um, the injury to the United States. What does that mean, and how can that be proven? That's also another sticking point in the whole WikiLeaks um, situation. I think you've heard a little bit of that here today. The question of, okay, you know, how damaging was it? Maybe back in the first tranche that came out, out about the DOD, the DOD documents about Afghanistan, there were informants' names, et cetera, et cetera, troop movements and the like. A lot of that stuff ended up getting taken out later on. It's um, obviously a sliding scale, and when you're dealing with the First Amendment, one of the justifications, especially if you're looking to prosecute a news organization, an organization sort of in the shoes of a, of, of a, a news outlet, um, you have to look at whether you're, you're justifying the prosecution and the incursion on their press activities in order to address real harm to the, the nation. And that's one of the big issues I'm sure the department's looking at right now, going through all the things that have been released through these WikiLeak um, disclosures and seeing what sort of identifiable, piece, identifiable, piece, identifiable pieces of damaging information are in there. And I don't know that I'm clear on this, and I turn to Mr. Schoenfeld. And do you believe the Espionage Act should apply to a, a foreign, a foreign defendant that's operating outside the United States? I, I think it, it could and, sh and should be applied. And I think that uh, what he's done, uh, what WikiLeaks has done, is to uh, certainly endanger, uh, as a number of ranking officials have said, endanger our forces and endanger, endanger uh, allied forces. And civilians in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, the, the idea that we, the United States has no recourse in the face of this uh, seems to me unacceptable. And I think the 
looking at the law, this is whoever discloses. And while you have the microphone, uh, and for the record again, I'd appreciate it if you could just summarize those five points that you made in the, the closing part of your opening statement. Well, if I might take the liberty of looking at them. Uh, <laughs> more attention to declassification, attention to giving legitimate whistleblowers viable avenues other than the media to which they can turn, reestablishing deterrence of leakers in the government so that those who leak have to reason to fear that they'll be prosecuted, bringing down uh, the weight of public opinion against uh, leakers, certainly, and against those who publish vital secrets, not just ordinary kinds of secrets that are the daily fare of, our, of American journalism, and in some extraordinary cases, prosecution of media outlets that publish secrets which endanger the public. And I, I would think, I mean, the classic case that has been mentioned here is the Chicago Tribune case from uh -huh. Midway, but there are other cases that have approached that line in more recent years. The Pentagon Papers case, the documents that Daniel Ellsberg turned over to, to, to the New York Times were historical in nature. There was not a single document in that collection that was less than three years old. Some of the material that, say, been published by the New York Times in the last year since 9-11 have been operational, ongoing intelligence programs, like the SWIFT monitoring program. That seems to skirt the line. I ride the New York City subways and so do millions of others, and there are people out there determined to bomb those. And this is a program designed to stop those people that was compromised. I think that's, you know, the seriousness of that, and I think the irresponsibility of, of journalism in some cases has been extraordinary in this period, much, much different from the, from the kinds of things that the Times published uh, in 1971. Do you care to speculate on their motive for releasing information as viewed as classified? Well, in the, there were two really substantial leaks in, the, in that period. Uh, the first was the NSA uh, warrantless wiretapping program. And there, the Times had an argument that this was a you know, violation of the FISA Act, and they wanted to bring it to a public station. I think there's legitimate debate about that. Uh, and uh, they, would, they believe in their, I think, that they performed a public service. When we come to the SWIFT, the SWIFT program, they had been warned by ranking officials, Democrats, Republicans, I mean, Lee Hamilton, one of the co-chairmen of the 9-11 Commission, not to publish this material, and they went ahead. And I don't think they've offered a very uh, convincing justification for doing so. Uh, one of the reporters, uh, Eric Lichtblau, said that the story was above all else, and this is a quote, an interesting yarn, above all else. Now, for, such a, for a step of such gravity, uh, I think one can't imagine a more trivial rationale. That answer says selling newspapers. Uh, gentlemen, my, my clock went red a while back, but I appreciate all your testimony and I yield back. I'm pleased to recognize the distinguished gentle lady from Houston, Texas, a, uh, a very active member of the committee, Sheila Jackson Lee. Chairman, let me thank you very much, and I don't want to be presumptuous to suggest that this may be uh, the last hearing of this session, but um, because I know that this committee works uh, into the very um, long hours into the night or into the session, but let me thank you very much uh, for your astuteness in recognizing the importance of this hearing. For those of us who are in a quandary, if you will, I sit on the Homeland Security Committee and spending many hours uh, in classified meetings uh, in the crypt, if you will, uh, listening to the array of threats against this country and, frankly, uh, around the world. But I may also, uh, or it comes to mind that um, if you uh, become too restrictive and you have a law that is ineffective in the espionage law, you also impact uh, what can be the modern day, uh, if you will, whistleblowers. And I know that there has been a distinction made with the Pentagon Papers, sort of an after fact reports as opposed to these documents that are current and in place. So I'd like you gentlemen to help me with the quandary that I'm in to uh, limit information, uh, limits the potential effectiveness of government. Um, but on the other hand, um, I don't know whether or not we had a hearing, Mr. Chairman, and you, I'm sure we did, and my memory fails me, but I remember distinctly a sitting vice president uh, blowing the cover of an active duty CIA agent, 
and it was interesting to uh, hear the response in that instance. Uh, this person's cover was blown, and that sitting vice president uh, just uh, thought that he was uh, completely right, uh, or either didn't admit it or had someone else, unfortunately, be the fall guy for it. But I think in the Judiciary Committee, it's important to really understand the law. There's some dispute. Uh, the WikiLeaks um, owner, um, leader, indicates that they did write the London ambassador uh, and sought uh, to have certain information didacted, and no one responded. But there is a November 27th letter from the State Department saying don't release anything. 